Here, I call the meeting to order the Whitley Select Board of April 4th, 2021. I'm getting an awful lot of feedback. Uh, okay, is this any clearer? Yes, now it is. I think it was that okay, maybe. Okay, okay. Call the call the meeting to order. The uh, first order of business is uh, meeting minutes, approval minutes of March 31st, 2021. Any comments on the minutes? I move we uh, approve the minutes uh, as written. Second. Jonathan seconded. Okay, roll call vote. Joyce? Aye. Jonathan? Yep. Fred, yes. Okay, vendor and payroll warrants. They were in our uh, schedule of, of attachments there. Any comments? No. Not for me. Okay, I'll approve them uh, tomorrow. Okay, public comments. Uh, anybody from the public have any item they want to discuss that's not on the agenda? We had one email submission, if you want me to read it. Okay. And the person's not on here, but um, it was from Dan Dennehy. He said, I would like to know if there is a plan for the removal and loaming seating for the 100 plus stumps Eversource has left around town, many on residence yards. If so, who is going to pay for it? Thank you, Dan Dennehy. I was actually wondering why those trees had all been, been removed. And I, now I guess I know that it was, it was Eversource. <clears throat> and my understanding is that that and Keith can correct me if I'm wrong, that's that's Eversource goes and seeks permission from the private property owners as to what they're gonna do with the trees and what they're gonna leave there. That is that's correct. Um the vast majority of all trees that, that they've done in their trimming and removal are on private property and all negotiated with the property owners. The trees that were done that I had a hearing for, some of them have been removed, some of them haven't. In the hearing we had, no one um, had any objections. The plan, it was a joint hearing with the planning board um, because on the um, streets that require it, North Street and Chestnut Plain are scenic roads and they require a joint hearing with the tree warden and the planning board, which we had and the planning board had no objections and no objections from the from the public and all of the homeowners who are affected were okay with it. So the ones that still need to be removed, there's some on Chestnut Plain Road and a few on North Street that still have yet to be done. And the ones on Christian Lane, the along the by the police station, um, those are where the choice was to either have the tops taken off and or removed and so when we had the hearing again that was the way it was proposed and the planning board again had no comment and i had no comment from the public either okay so the, the ones that well, majority of these on private property i guess that we have no responsibility for doing anything with the stumps or what's remaining I guess, and the ones on, on town property, I think, Keith, you, you have a program or whatever that you eventually re start replacing trees around town on, on town property, right? That is correct. You know, we, we try to plant some trees where possible. Um, one of some, you know, some of the times the issue is that with the distances that Eversource has to 15 feet away from their power lines, it, it's almost impossible for me to plant a tree on the side of the road on town property, which where the utility wires are. On the other side of the road, it's easy and no problem. So um, many of these locations are cutting the trees. It's because they're underneath power lines. And as time has gone on, they're under more scrutiny as far as every time the power goes out and having more responsibility to, to ensure that the power doesn't go out. And one of the only ways to do it, to improve it is to 
remove the trees that are going to impact their wires when and if the storm blows them down. But yes, Fred, that we will plant trees where it's feasible every year, every year we can. And another thing at Eversource, since they know they've done a lot in this town, they have offered to plant some trees at their expense this year also. And so I'm working on that right now to secure a few locations where that can be done. And we're shooting to have it done on Arbor Day. So if, if I can ask a question, I'm, I'm curious about something and, and I will express my absolute lack of knowledge on this. Um, the trees that are removed when they're within the eight foot town, you know, whatever you call it. Right away. Right away. It strikes me that we should be able to ask Eversource because it's not, it's, it's private property, but it's not private property. And it strikes me that Eversource should be doing stump removal because the property owners typically don't have the kind of cash to do stump removal. And it's, it's not, it's not cheap. And if Eversource isn't required to do it, my guess is they're not going to do it. And visually, it is an incredible eyesore. So I, I guess I, I'm, I'm perplexed as to what options we have, if any, because we, we can't have a bunch of stumps on the, on the, you know, in a row that be, you guys get my point. I understand your, your question about that. Um, again, I, I'm not aware of any way to, to, to force them. And again, all, all of the stuff that's on private property, um, maybe it would be in the best interest. And I, I've never been in that position where I've had to negotiate with Eversource or their contractor to say, I'd be glad to have you take the tree down, but I want you to take the stump out too. I don't know if anybody's tried that. Well, but couldn't a property owner say, you're not going to take the stump out, then you're not going to take the tree out? That's a possibility. And at that point in time, they may just say, okay, we'll, we'll do nothing more than trim them. Um, in fact, there are some homeowners on Christian Lane that said, do not t I do not want the trees down that you want to take down. And the only thing I'll allow you to do is trim them. And so there are a few houses on Christian Lane on, uh, you know, especially on the, um, the west side, or no, the north side of Christian Lane, that the trees were just trimmed. But, but Keith, isn't it fair to say, if the town decides to take a tree down like that, because the town thinks that it's the, you know, it needs to, for whatever reason, the property owner is going to say, town, remove the stump. And we would have to. Why? doesn't ever source fall under that same guideline. Again, I, you know, I don't know how it, that's a total negotiation on private property. Yeah. Um, so can I ask an a question here? What's the process of that negotiation? Like, do they have something signed by the property owner that said, yeah, it's okay to take that tree out and leave the stump? Or is it just, they didn't show up for the planning board hearing, therefore it's assumed they consent. I, I don't, I, when you explained the process earlier, it didn't sound to me like it really involved contacting the owners of the property to see how they felt about stumps out on the front. Again, I, I, I have not been in a position to have to negotiate with Eversource on a tree removal on my property. So I don't know. Okay. So, so we so we're hearing from somebody who may or may not have a tree stump on his property, but he's complaining about the the, um, the mess left on other people's properties. The people on the property are not complaining at this point. Is that my is that am I reading that correctly? And then, but because you explained a process earlier for North Street because it was a scenic route that you had to have the tree warden and. Nobody showed up to complain. So does that mean that 
I mean, that sounded like that was the consent process, and that doesn't sound like much of a consent process. Well, that's so. the that's the state law. That's what I'm required to do. Um, and uh, for, but that's for scenic roads, correct? But do they then also need to negotiate with the landowners? Then no. I, well, I then maybe the the thing. I, I, all I can say is what happens on private property is between the contractor and a, and a property owner it has nothing to do with the town as far as I'm concerned. But it is, but but it's in the town right of way, Keith. That's no, what no, no. Oh, so these trees are not in the town right of way. No, not at all. They're all on private property. Okay, I I, I got the impression that they were in that no man's. Okay. Okay. Oh, so then maybe the response to this person would be, you know, it's between that homeowner and the contractor. Um, I mean, uh, unless there's more information that we don't have, I don't see that we have anything to say here, really. It's just like there was a, a, a one of the very large oak trees down on River Road, um, a resident actually from Deerfield came and complained when the contractor was getting ready to take it down. They opted to contact me a second time, which I had already looked at once and had told them it was on private property. I went back and measured and took, you know, with the property pins and confirmed that it was clearly on private property. And so again, that was a negotiation between the property owner. I have no jurisdiction on private property. Right. So I guess this will be my final comment and then I'll, and then I'll shut up. But <laughs> if I'll, I'll, I'll use me as an example. If, if, a, if, if Eversource came to me and said, we want to take down a tree in your front yard, I would obviously incorrectly, but I would automatically assume that their definition of removing removal, the, the Removal of a tree included the entire tree. That apparently would not be an accurate assumption. So what I think we should do is make sure that people in town are aware that removal of a tree does not necessarily include the stump. And so you need to be cognizant of the fact that your negotiation needs are the whole tree and not to leave an eyesore in my front yard. And we should tell Eversource, if you really want to be good community neighbors, you should take the entire tree and not leave uh, a, a stump that is unsightly and potentially dangerous. If you, especially if you have little kids and on and on. I mean, it just strikes me that Eversource is trying to get away with minimal amounts of, of work and, and there's not, enough transparency in the, into the entire process. Okay, well, I, I think the, the other thing you're gonna run into is when when these tree companies cut down a tree, that's to, to my knowledge, and I've experienced this, and I know other people have, they cut down a tree, that's it, period. That that's That's their job. To remove the stump is a separate activity. And they, they all ask you if you want to remove the stump and you pay extra for that. So you got you got two processes there, removing the tree and removing the stump. That's kind of, to me, a common thing that tree companies do. When you say remove a tree, it's not going to be both, or you better make sure it includes both or not. I know Keith's experience with tree companies, that's probably the same thing they're telling him. I, I'm just saying, Fred, that I'm I'm guessing I'm not I'm not that uncommon in terms of my assumption. Perhaps I'm wrong in that assumption, but I'm not uncommon in the assumption that when someone says I will remove I'm I, I'm asking permission to remove a tree from your yard, it's the whole stupid tree. Wow. And you and, and people who don't say that are taking advantage of people's lack of awareness. Uh, that, that. That, that could be true, yeah. Okay, the, the, other, the other thing, not to belabor this any further, but uh, Eversource has, has gone, at least on Christian Lane, and, and identified 
I would say almost all the telephone poles to be replaced. After they cut the trees down on that one side where the poles were, now they're gonna go replace the poles. Did they ever think of putting the poles on the other side of the road where there's no trees? Of course, it's more of an expense to them because you can't stick the new pole right adjacent to the old one and, and just transfer wires. You gotta go across the road, but, uh, and I don't think there is a requirement for them for replacing poles to come to the town to ask. So, you know, to me, it would have made sense. They could have left majority of them on Christian Lane if they put the poles on the other side of the road. So, okay. Did somebody, somebody else have a question before we move on? Amy. Amy? Can I, um, it was my understanding that Eversource does have the homeowner sign a piece of paper either stating that they want the tree removed or just limbs to be removed. I guess we could always ask Eversource for a copy of what the homeowner signs to see if it does have anything about stump removal. I mean, I, I would love for that to be accurate. I'm not sure that we're allowed to, we have the jurisdiction to ask someone for a private contract. I think it would be a favor. I don't think we could we could require it. But I, I get your sentiment. I agree with it. I just, but it would have to be a, yeah, we'll do this for you because why not? I just, I, I just think it, 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 it's incumbent upon us to inform, to make sure that we have informed citizens. And if that means that we should have Eversource come in for 10 minutes to discuss what their processes for requesting tree removal from, from private property so that they're not fleecing private homeowners, then I think that's fine. And I'm not saying that they're intentionally doing it, but it may be just, they haven't thought it through and they're not, it just hasn't evolved. The decision-making hasn't evolved sufficiently. And I think we should force that evolution. I don't know, we're getting into a, a process between uh, the homeowner and Eversource that, uh, I don't know, what would we gain out of that other than making the homeowner happy, I guess the town got involved, but we have no legal jurisdiction to do anything. Awareness is our job, Fred. Well, it, it's yeah. nothing new. I, maybe maybe yeah, because... now it's more, more aware because there's more trees been cut down, but. And if we had been aware of this already, we could have spent two minutes explaining the answer and moving on. So I would be happy to know the information if we can think of Amy, if you can think of an easy way to get um, get a hold of one of those contracts, let's do it and let's learn something and then move on. Exactly, right. Let's move and figure out if we, what we can do and what we can't do. Okay, let's move on to the agenda. Any further? Anybody else have any dis further comments on this subject before we move on? No? Okay. Uh, we don't have any scheduled appointments. Next item is uh, COVID-19 state of emergency. Uh, we've got resolutions, orders, and whatever on that. Uh, Brian, is there anything we need to discuss or change on that? I don't think so. Okay. Okay, next item under all business, discuss and vote whether to offer in-person early warning, early voting for the June 8th, 2021 local election. Offer in-person early voting. And I guess we've done this, what, last year already? Yeah, yeah I, I think it, um, this was kind of lost in, in the discussion that we had with Lynn about, about the, the June 8th meeting. Um, and I guess another decision point was, well, the the one we voted on was to move the election to the to hold at the town hall. But there also needs to be a decision whether to off, offer um, in person early voting from May twenty eighth to June fourth. It would be during regular business hours. Um, it would be at the town offices. Uh, it has to be pre pre shutdown, pre COVID hours. Um, and this would be along. This would this would go along with the. Um, if, if the board's going to um, make it a possibility to allow, um, it would go along with early mail-in voting as well. 
as, as you know, as long as it's not, we should be doing everything we can to encourage people to vote. Uh, you know, and the one the one thing is we want to make sure that it doesn't, the volume doesn't paralyze all other operations within 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 the clerk's office. But we we should we, this shouldn't even be a well. <laughs> we always want to have conversation. But I would say we want to do this. How's that? Um, I have a question, though. Um, what I'm hearing, though, is that we would need to have our town offices open uh, pre-COVID hours. Yes. So we would have to be open more hours per week than we currently are. And I'm wondering, I know we sort of chose the now uh, reduced hours based on the ability for our employees to cope. And unless something's changed there, I, I wonder if having the extra open hours is gonna be a problem. If it's a problem, it's only for a week. So it might be that for that week, it's solvable. Um, but I just wanted to ask if that's um, something that you already know the answer to maybe, Brian, um, if we were to be open more hours for that week before the election, is that gonna cause a lot of trouble with the just regular operations of the town on that day at, at for Sandy Lane? Um, and again, I'll, I'll do my best to, <laughs> to speak for Lynn, but I, I don't think, I, I guess this cut, cuts both ways is, is I don't think we expect a, a high turnout of mm -hmm. in-person. Um, so no, I, I don't think it would overwhelm the, the offices. Okay. And having to have the offices open more hours than usual is not going to be a problem. Uh, we typically have, uh, you have people there anyway. Uh, I mean, typically we have somebody from the clerk's office, you know, that's, that's, that's there um, during the, during the typical, you know, the, the clerk's hours. Or the pre-COVID hours, I guess that's the thing. So right. Yeah. Open pre-COVID hours on those days. Then I, I mean, I don't want to vote for something that's going to send everything topsy turvy when I know perfectly well that if anybody who wanted to vote in person <laughs> could just come and do an absentee ballot, stand right there, fill it out and hand it back. Um, so it, it's to me, there's, there's just, there's not a big difference between coming in and filling out your absentee ballot and coming into quote early vote. So um, I, I don't really understand the difference in the workload if it's, um, but I don't object to uh, having that early voting for with expanded hours at all. I just want to be realistic about what the difference really isn't a heck of a lot. It's really the number of hours the doors are open. So maybe if we decide that safety wise, we're okay with one week of having the doors open more hours than we have had in the past, then great. Doesn't sound like it will really affect the workflow in the town office. So, sorry, I'll shut up now. <laughs> okay, but Brian, are we talking on a weekend, a Saturday being open? Um, that includes, your days include a weekend. I thought last time there was a weekend time. I, oh. I don't recall. Or is there an evening time? Is this going to the evening, one of the evenings? It would go the late day that we had pre-COVID. Right. Right. Basically, they say you have to have your your early voting available on uh, for the same hours you had before COVID. And before COVID, we had like one day per week that went to eight o'clock. Right. But there were no weekend hours pre-COVID. Right. OK. I, I'm fine with this, you guys. I, I it, it, you know, Lynn and Brian know the staffing and they know the pattern, the, the, the traffic flow patterns. Um, you, let, let, let's get people voting and, and, and hopefully we're going to see more people vote in a municipal election than historically do. And we should jump for joy. Mm -hmm. Okay. We need a motion. Motion. Second. Okay. Okay. Roll call vote. Joyce. Aye. Jonathan. Yep. Fred. Yes. Okay. Moving on. Uh, new business. 
discuss and, and vote to sign an <coughs> APR document for the Sobieski property on, on River Road? Brian? Yeah, so as I noted in, in, the, in the notes that I sent, this was voted. Um, the amount was voted on to um, pay for this APR. It's uh, it's two thirty nine River Road. Um, it's so it's south of Hurley Park on the other side. I think just south of um, Pachesnik property. I think. Mm -hmm. um, so the, um, there's ten thousand seven hundred fifty dollars of CPA monies that was appropriated at the last ATM, um, and just like all the other ones, the town is being added as a co holder to the restriction. Um, so this is just the paperwork. Um, to have the town added as a co-holder to the to the agricultural land easement, um, and and then if the if the board approves it, I would just ask Fred to come in and sign. Motion. Uh, yeah, there, there's no like we're not on the hook for something here. This is just making the paperwork flow through, right? Yes. That I would second that then. Okay, and is this? Been supported by what ag commission or other departments? Yeah, this is this is really just the paperwork for to execute the the APR. It was all passed at town meeting. All the support yep. came out of town, town meeting. Okay. okay, roll call vote. Joyce? Aye. Jonathan? Yes, sir. Fred? Yes. Okay, moving on. The next item is to point Matthew Jakatowicz. As the town building custodian, Brian. Um. Yeah. This is to a point. <laughs> yeah. Like you said. Um. Matt is the custodian at the library right now, and he's looking to add additional hours. Um. We advertise the position, and and we think and we reviewed the resumes, and we think he's the best, the best, uh, the best choice at this point. Did Did we get an overwhelming response? It, it's been. Actually, no, the last time was for uh, highway position. Um, and it was underwhelming, I think, actually, in my opinion. Um, How many hours are we looking for this? Uh, we gave a range this time uh, of six to 10 per week. Okay. It's like almost everything, it seems these days, it's going to depend on the, the trajectory of the COVID pandemic as to how much. So the, the only the town That's buildings me. would be the town offices and the town hall that we're adding. Yeah. This position. Okay. At, at least to start, yeah. Right. Okay. I make a motion that we we appoint Matthew Jakatowicz as as a town building custodian. Second. Second. Third. Okay. Roll call vote, Joyce? Aye. Jonathan? Yep. Fred, yes? Okay. Moving on, discuss and vote to approve the installation of stop signs at the following intersections. Hey, Fred, if we could just go back for a second. Yeah. Uh, I, I just have to have two things. One is I have good information that the early voting hours don't include weekends. Okay. Um, I can't disclose my source, of course, but... Um, <laughs> Is but she's not on the she's not on this meeting. But I I have a way to room? I have a way to find out. Um, and and yeah, also we need to talk about the, the personnel committee recommendations, please. What's item B? Oh, did I skip one? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go back to personnel committee recommendations. Um, so I have I put a memo in your packet. Um, per, of what the personnel committee is recommending. Um, there's salary adjustments to um, assistant assessor, highway superintendent, senior operator laborer, fire chief, transfer station attendant, board clerk uh, for the zoning and planning and election workers. Um, the personnel committee also made a recommendation to the water commissioners that that, that salary be um, increased. Um, and I'll just go back for a minute and talk about the process that the personnel committee does. Um, so they, they've identified 10 comparable towns 
and they we request salary information or or wages every um, fiscal year, and we compare those uh, to Waitley's, and we compare them to the uh, the median actual, and they see which ones um, seem to be lower, and. We also provide the, the personnel committee also provides the opportunity for um, either boards and committees who, who supervise uh, an employee or the employees themselves if they feel like the information in the survey um, doesn't accurately represent their position or their responsibilities. They can present additional information as, as to um, why they think um, their information is, is a little bit more accurate uh, and the personnel committee listens to them. Um, and then they take a vote. Um, and those are the those are the three seven positions that the personnel committee has decided should be increased. Um, and then we'll maybe we take these one at a time, but the personnel committee also looks at um, whether to recommend a cost of living increase. And they look at, um, we try to look at comparable towns, but that hasn't been too successful because everyone's trying to do um, the same analysis at the same time. And the committee looks at um, consumer price index. They look at um, the amount of um, uh, increase that Social Security has given. And um, that's really about it in terms of... Um, recommending a COLA. Um, and this year, the, the personal committee is recommending a, a 2% cost of living increase. Um, can I ask a question? Do we have a, a, a matrix of some kind that demonstrates how often each of these respective positions are being um, are, are being discussed for a salary bump in order to fall into the average, because as everyone knows, and, and again, you know, the, these people are, 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 you know, deserve every dime that they, that they, that they earn, <clears throat> but plotting salary by community average is by definition going to constantly escalate that, that, that dollar amount beyond the cost of living. Because when you move from below average to average, it changes the average for everyone. So I guess I'm wondering what the, what the organic schedule is of changing the, of, of these position bumps. Is it every three years for these positions? I mean, how often are, you get my question? Because it's going to, it's, it's going to accelerate every X number of years. It just that's just big <clears throat> math. Yeah, could I speak to that? Yeah, go ahead. I understand the argument that that it might accelerate, and yet I think we have public servants who are not, you know, making money hand over fist. Right. They're not getting. You know, I I don't think we're in, in the end overpaying people. Um, I think the choice of towns for that comparison is really really important because we didn't just pick towns that are nearby and pick towns with similar tax base, similar um, similar populations, similar like ratio of uh, you know industry to, to um, real estate. But I mean, we really looked at things that make, you know, uh, but both of that speak to what the town can afford and what the town actually needs. Uh, the person to do. So um, there's enough pressure on towns to keep those wages low um, and not let them spiral out of control that I don't think the, the kind of the math that you're talking about will win in the end. Joyce, I, I'm not asking the question because I don't think that the increases are justified. I'm asking the mm -hmm. question because we need to be transparent about it. Again. No, oh no, I I, I understand. I'm, but I'm I'm explaining why that 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 list is really important. Oh, okay, it's important that we don't compare ourselves to towns who can afford 
to pay top dollar for every town employee. Okay, we're not comparing ourselves to rich towns. We're, so so some, of, some of the concern you may have about this kind of leading to kind of a spiral out of control is taken care of in the choice of towns that we compare ourselves to. That's all I'm trying to say. Right, and, and, and that's fine. I just think that it should be on a matrix, some type of a spreadsheet or, or whatever. It is. It's on a spreadsheet. It's been presented at every uh, personnel committee public meeting. But but how often? But but I guess so. We'll we'll use assistant assessor because it's the first one on the list. Mm -hmm. How often are we looking at the assistant assessor position and say, oh, this position is no longer um, meeting the average salary for our comparison towns? Oh. That's an interesting case because that's one where we didn't use our comparison towns. Okay. That's one where the assessors came and took a different set of comparison towns and said, we should compare to those ones instead. I personally strenuously objected to that, but I was outvoted. The personnel committee decided to go with a different set of comparison towns for that one position and no others. Oh, okay. And I probably would agree with you that we should be using the same towns regardless. And, but yeah. then, then use senior operator laborer. How often is that position being bumped because it no longer fits into the average? That, and, and that information is important to just have out there. That's my only... It, it is out there, John. It's in the minutes of the personnel committee meetings from all of the past... Well, all the years that we've had personnel committee meetings. So someone would have to dig into that. Why don't we just make that matrix available for, 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 for transparency? I mean, what do you mean they have to dig for it? It's, it's publicly available. Um, and it's, and it's just a spreadsheet and it's got all of the years in it. It's one document. Somebody asked for one document. It is they get one document. It's, it's yeah. for, we, for, I can for email years. it to you for 30 years. I, this is probably uh, the last four years in an Excel spreadsheet that I have. Okay, I'm talking about the lifespan of that position. Yeah. How often are we doing this? And four okay. years Honestly, to answer that. I guess I'd rather have Brian doing things like getting us grants. <laughs> so uh -huh. so uh, it, it, it really does. It comes down to what, you know, what are we going to ask our town employees to spend their time on? And with that information actually publicly available, somebody who wants to know that can find it out. And I know it's not easy. It's not going to be something where you can look and make a quick decision in 20 minutes. But honestly, what do we want our town employees doing? The, the personnel committee could do it, Joyce. Uh, all, the, all these positions Among are, all the are, on, <laughs> are on FERCOG's website. They do a salary survey of all positions of every town. Now, they don't compare one to the other. Well, they do, yes, on a spreadsheet, there, they, there is some comparison. Then they go into more detail on certain towns that have specific or specialized positions. So that is available on FERCOG website. Let me just say, for the, like the assistance assessor position that we looked at here, uh, that has never been increased. For 28 years that that person is in that position, First, that salary has never been increased as comparison to other towns, either in Franklin County or on the, the 10 sites that the town has decided for comparison. And, and that, the, the other thing is the proposal that she's look, that they're looking at the 2650 is not the average of depending on what you include in the average. That is not the average of assessor, assistant assessor positions. So, you know, there wasn't like. But the personnel committee went through it. It went through the democratic process. This is what the yeah. personnel committee is recommending. We're not, we don't need to relitigate it. No, I'm not. It's already just, been through it. I'm just saying that it could be on a big span of time spreadsheet. It's not that hard. Okay. Okay, so Brian, we need to, uh, what, first act on the salary adjustments? Yeah, if you want to take them. Are we doing it? Yeah, separately? however you want to take them. Okay. I, 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 it's up to you how you want to take them, Fred. I, 
I would at least do the salary adjustments and COLA separately. Um, okay. If you don't have reason to, 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 to separate these out, then you might just want to do them all together. But. Well, these were, these were all recommended by personnel committee. Okay. This is your recommendations. Okay. Uh, and our vote is to vote to approve this or to, you know, basically give it our seal of approval and move it on. Then, then we should be voting on each on, on the whole on, on the whole the whole group as one if we can rather than individually because the three of us have no more or less knowledge on individual actions as, as, as group actions so if we're allowed to we should we should hear a motion on the 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 slate if you will and we because there's no more or less information for any individual one. It's kind of silly unless we have to by law to, to take up each individual case. Okay, I'll make a motion that we approve the increases proposed here for these uh, seven positions recommended by a personnel committee. A second. Okay, further discussion? Okay, roll call vote, Joyce. Aye. Jonathan? Fine. Fred? Yes. Okay, moving on. The other next item from them, personnel committee was on the, the COLA. Brian, you have some information share on that? Like I had said before, the personnel committee voted a, um, about 2% cost of living, and I lost my place here. Yeah. Um, two percent cost of living. Is that what the national coal has been this year? Um, no, it's broken down. Um, it's broken down by region. This is an overview table. There it is. Okay. So this reflects net regional coal. This is a twelve month. Um, this is what this is what we use. Yeah, the, or this is what the personnel committee has looked to in the past. The twelve months. So there's a U.S. city average, Northeast region, New England, Boston, Cambridge, Newton. Yeah, and none of these are, are close to the, the, the 2%. And the other thing I make a comment on, if you're considering Social Security was only, what, 1.69% mm -hmm. this last year as well. So what was the reason for the 2%? The to me, this table doesn't show it doesn't doesn't support a two percent. I guess my other question would be, and I'm not making a, a value judgment yet, but does the cola increase highly volatile commodities such as food and and and, and energy, more specifically energy, or is energy taken out because of the volatility that that exists in that in that market? Yes, it's I, I would think it's the CPI index, whatever's included in there, Jonathan. I, I don't know specifically. So, sometimes, sometimes it includes those, those, um, those uh, elements, and sometimes it doesn't, though, Fred. And yeah, you, I, you, I don't I, know. You'd have you to get into one or the other. You'd have to get into that CPI discussion, CPI details to see what's included and what isn't. Yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to look up look that up. But but the ones here, you know, I guess you can do a U.S. city average. But if you look at Northeast region, New England, you're one point two. Well, you even got one point five, depending on what percent change column you want to look at. Mm -hmm. Or Boston, Cambridge which is a bigger city, but the rest of it is the 1.1 to 1.5. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, one other number that isn't showing up here that influenced the personnel committee was that um, the other employees of the town at the, in the school district were getting a 2% raise. That actually had an influence. I know we don't have to do that, but the personnel committee made the decision that they did 
with numbers other than these in front of them as well. And um, that's, so just uh, put that in there. Right, and that's, that's our annual challenge, as we all know, that, that different employees are, 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 have, have different collective bargaining. Um, you know, some are contracted, that 2% is contractually driven. Um, you know, we, it, we have never treated our employees on, on, on an even playing field. Um, and, and, and it's a problem. But we should. Maybe we should. Well, that, and this I maybe is what the personnel right. committee is saying. So, Brian, do we know what other other towns uh, are proposing for their colas? Um, not really. Everybody's the problem we run into is that everybody's trying to do this at the same time. Yeah. Um, I think we saw a range of between one and a. For the few that we had, I think we saw a range of between one and a half to two and a half. Um, I think it was somewhere in there. Um, FERCOG was doing, I think FERCOG was doing two and a half. Uh, the caveat there is that they were doing a two and a half with, um, a, a, there was an effort to elevate their pay and that's how they were doing it because they did a, a, a wage salary analysis with other regional planning agencies. Right, but they're, they're, not, they're not a municipality, so I'm not sure, that, that's apples and oranges. No. Brian, the, the impact of say that if you go to two percent on the town budget was what something like fourteen thousand dollars. Yep. And if you go to say one and a half percent, how much difference or what would that number be? Um eleven thousand based on FY21 salaries. So yeah, it would be eleven compared to fourteen. Not a lot of money. Our, mm -hmm. you guys, our system of government relies upon volunteer committees to make recommendations. You know, and 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 if we're gonna have that form of government, then we have to live with their recommendations at some level because they are supposed to be more knowledgeable about their their individual responsibilities. And areas of, 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 of focus than, than we are, and we rely on their knowledge. If we're going to rely on volunteer committees, then we have, I don't, I don't see what rationale we have to say, no, you, 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 you don't know what you're talking about. Because if we say that about committees, then we shouldn't have committees in, in those positions. So <coughs> I think we just go with this proposal, though. I, I don't, you know, yeah, I, I, it's just what, it's just the hand we're dealt. Okay, Jonathan, are you making a... Uh, no, I don't want to make a motion, but it's the hammer belt and we should go along with it. <laughs> I move that we just, all we're doing is consenting and, and accepting their report, right? I, well, we're saying this is what will go into the budget. Or we don't actually make the decision, the finance no, committee does, but we're, we're basically saying we've seen this and we support it. But we don't get to make the final decision. Well, so I move that we support the personnel committee's recommendation. We will we will put our recommendation on the warrant, though. Joyce is my point, or not? Well, we're not deciding that right now. No, but so I move we support the personnel committee's recommendation on a two percent cola. Fine. I, I need a second on that. Okay. But it sounds like there's no second. So no, maybe no, we're no, not going to no, approve I'll, this. I'll second it with the caveat that it's just a horrible form of government. I'll, I'll second it, Joyce. Okay. Okay. Uh, roll call vote, Joyce. Aye. Jonathan? Yeah. Fred? Yes. Okay. Anything else from personnel committee, Brian? Nope. Okay. And moving on, uh, next item is the installation of stop signs at 
We've got four locations here. And, and I guess I like to propose a, a fifth location, but let's talk about the four that we have here. I think they're, they're to me, they're, they're easy to identify where they are, except the, the fourth one, I, I guess. I'm not sure, North Street, Chestnut Plain Road, exactly. It, it's the, Fred, if you're coming off Christian Lane and you know the, the, the ramp you take to go up to North Street, or to go to Swamp Road, front down from Christian Lane. It's at the end of that. It's at the end of that. I'm going to call it a ramp. Oh, that that sharp downhill yeah, the, ramp. The jog the jog north down that slope. Oh, okay. It is. A, it's a blind spot on going to the left because of the hill to some extent. People fly by. They don't. There's no stop, so they don't stop. And you know, I I am easily the one who drives of the people on this call i'm easily the one who drives that more than anyone else because i live 200 yards the crow flies from it. but um, but that ramp is it is that called north street no i i when i i don't i don't know i don't know that it has a name it, that, but there should be a stop sign at the end of that ramp before you get to the area that transitions from chestnut plain to north street right before the bridge okay i, I don't know what it's called I don't think it has a name. It's technically Christian Lane. Um, Jonathan, one of the things that, yeah. that I would recommend we do with the, at this point in time with the entire um, triangle there in every direction is um, I think it's appropriate time to bring in Mass DOT. I can contact them and we can get um, a traffic engineer to come and take a look at the entire intersection of every angle in and make um, recommendations from a from a traffic engineer's standpoint. Okay, that makes sense. And that one, that, you know, that's the one that's in my mind of all the other three listed is um, the one I think we need to look at more carefully. Whereas the other three locations are pretty much all, um, I won't say no brainer, but they're at right angles um, and they're they're pretty straightforward. Well, I mean, Keith, yeah. with all due respect, I, I would consider that a stop, something at that intersection, a no-brainer to do something because it is a disaster waiting to happen. Okay. Well, the only, the only stop condition in that intersection is for on Swamp Road, right? Swamp Road stops, but nobody else. Correct. Swamp Road has a stop sign when they come up to North Street. Up to North Street. And I understand what you're saying, Jonathan, and I think it probably would warrant a stop sign there. And I'm not saying it wouldn't. The, the other thing I'm just saying, we've had many a times where as you're traveling south and coming up to towards the center of town, there's all where it's yield signs are. They've had many people that want stop signs there too. So I'm just saying, I think this would be an appropriate time um, for me to contact District 2 and get an input from um, a, a design engineer, traffic engineer. And I think that we could do that relatively quick. It's not a, it should not be a long drawn out process. Because it's just a bigger, bigger picture than just, uh, okay. Yeah. Do, do we know if there's, has there been any accidents at this, at that intersection anywhere? You know, we, we've discussed it before with the police department, and um, there is not, surprisingly, a high um, volume of accidents there. Uh, a lot of people will, will confirm that, you know, close calls, but yeah. Yeah. close calls do not show up in, 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 in accident reports. Right. Okay. The, the other location that I like to propose here is Claverick Road and Chestnut Plain Road. There's nothing there today, right? That's that is that is correct. That's another one. And again, there's just there's still other ones that probably warrant stop signs in town, and it's just that they've never been. And so, um, I certainly have no issue of of including, for that matter, both ends of Claverick Road. Right. All right. Okay, Joyce, you have something. 
Yeah, um, I was thinking of something sort of along the lines of what Fred was saying, but um, are these just places where somebody thinks we need a stop sign or there's just a lot of intersections in town without stop signs and without stop signs and without problem. So I, I always kind of assumed that an assessment had been done. And for example, I'm right at Westbrook Road and Chestnut Plain Road. And <clears throat> I had always w figured, oh, there's a reason why there's not a stop sign. Maybe the traffic counts don't really call for it. That, you know, because this is something that people study, like whether an intersection needs a stop sign or not. So I'm wondering where this list came from. Was it just like places we ought to consider or is there reasons to put these up? <coughs> and if we put them up, I mean, what are the consequences we put them up or we don't? I don't really understand. I'm not a traffic engineer. I don't know enough about how that decision ought to be made. But I'm just wondering where this list came from. Was it just because somebody noticed, hey, I think there should be one there, but maybe that person's also not a traffic engineer. I, let me, I, I, I've had experience with, with traffic signs for years. Uh, there is federal and state requirements that where two, inter, two roads intersect, that there should be some traffic control. And that it, it kind of doesn't matter that much on the volume. You look around town, there's subdivisions have stop signs. So it's not the volume level, but but the the, the thing that's gonna matter the most is the liability issue to the town. If there was an accident somewhere where there should have been a stop sign and there wasn't either for either, I, I don't know, it never was for whatever reason, uh, an attorney could sue the town for not having adequate traffic control at an intersection. Yeah. Then could we ask Keith to just have someone from Department of Transportation with those, the office you had mentioned earlier, I don't know if I said it right, to take a look at these and tell us, like have a professional who does this as their job, come in, make a recommendation on these intersections. Because I, I really don't feel like I'm qualified to vote on this right now, I would abstain or vote no, just because for lack of, of, of real information, I think he's got a very sensible suggestion. Maybe someone will come up with a better suggestion of, of what we should do for traffic control there. But I think just you know, throwing up stop signs everywhere because we think attorneys might sue us is probably not the best strategy either. Well, I, I, was, gonna, I was gonna change what, what Fred said a little bit I'm not worried about the liability. I'm worried about if someone got got gravely hurt because of a lack of stop sign. Okay. Shame on us. It has nothing to do with cash. It has everything to do with people's people's lives, and it's somebody's mother, father, daughter, or son. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and 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 I do know that coming down Westbrook Road onto Chestnut Plain Road, and people are taking a right, they don't stop. They just go. Yeah. Because there's not a stop sign. And that's my point. <laughs> you're not required to stop, but you're required to look because you're on the minor road going on to the major road and state law is really clear. In that situation, Westbrook Road has to yield to Chestnut Plain Road. And it's not been a problem. Well, like, I'm as, because there has so that's why a professional might be that's, that's not a reason. That's not a reason for not putting a stop sign here because it hasn't been a problem. And, and as far as how many others in, in town, I, I think Keith will tell you, he could probably count them on one hand with their, in, in addition to these, how many other locations mm -hmm. in town don't have stop signs. I think it's fewer than you can count on one hand. And I guess I, I've been aware of this for a while driving around town. And I, and I think it's something that it should be very easy for the town to put up a stop sign here. That, that's our, our responsibility. We don't need a professional to come and tell us you need a sign or not. It's going to refer you I, to the guidelines. I just don't think we're ever going to agree on that, Fred. Well, I think we need a professional. Joyce, Joyce, okay. at, Joyce, at the risk of you getting really mad at me. Oh, that, that'll that never happen, Chuck. No, some, there's, there's, there's nobody on the personnel committee that are labor specialists or talent acquisition professionals. That 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 have that have a degree in 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 inciting people's um, salaries. They're doing it because they're good volunteer citizens. 
So mm -hmm. we make decisions all the time without professional experts and their advice. Right, but I think this is something where we need a professional. But and, why, and they why exist, they and they exist, at the, and, and they're, they're somebody that Keith knows and can call and can talk, and it's expertise that the state provides. We're already paying for it. Why not take advantage of it? I mean, I think traffic engineering is a little bit different than trying to decide at 2% COLA. Oh, I'm okay? not. Yeah, that's, okay, let's, let's I, come I, back I, to I just, I, I don't agree with just us as a group thinking that we know enough about traffic to decide where to put up stop signs. We have to put up a stop sign every time some citizen thinks, I need a stop sign here. That's, that's not so what we're talking I think that's, about. We're, I think talking that's about town, we're talking about town roads here that have traffic on them. That the town is responsible and they have had that traffic on it since forever. I've lived here more than almost 30 years. There's not been a stop sign at the bottom of Westbrook Road. That's not a reason the whole to time. not put one there. But, but I, not, I, right? I, so but, there's a reason why there hasn't been one there. I, I, I'd had, like I to don't know, know. The reason. I've had a couple of people almost hit me. Yeah. At that location. And okay. and Let's, anywhere else in town. But I I'm all I'm asking for is expertise that is available okay i'm not saying i'm asking a volunteer to do this for free keith has expertise at his disposal he could get it maybe the person will come back and say yeah you have a good strong case for a, a stop sign here or okay. you don't have a good strong case and explain why but i'd like to know that and i think we 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 should we should just look into it okay. we should because that expertise is available and we should just do it and okay, let, and let's let's stop now. I, I think it's time for to to hear what Keith has to, has to say. He's been sitting here listening to all this, and he may have already talked to a professional that knows the answers. That uh, we don't need to do anything further. Okay, Keith, you have the the podium here. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. I at this point in time, and no, Fred, I have not, and those these locations, I have not spoken to Mass DOT in the traffic engineer about it. However, as Joyce said, it is at our disposal. I can contact Mass DOT and for that matter, these four locations plus both ends of, of Claverick Road. And for that matter, now's the time. Why not look at all of the intersections that we have that do not have any traffic control up at all and come up with a recommendation for all of them. Um, it, it should only be, you know, we're, this shouldn't some, be something that takes months or years. We should be able to get it done and get an answer back to you as the board in a quick turnaround. I'm fine having an expert come in. I, I'll be very upfront that I'm going to be hard pressed. I mean, if they make an outstanding case to change my mind, but at this point, I, I'll be shocked if I have my mind changed, but I'm open to it. Okay, so do you want to come back, Keith, with a with a more complete list uh, of every road in town that doesn't have a traffic control? Not not only stop sign, but I guess there's yield or right of way signs as, as well. Some don't have that either. So I, I will I will do that, and um, I, I don't. I would like the permission to just go ahead and have mass dot review those locations versus me having to wait until the next select board meeting to come back and say i came up with, come up with another one i just assume let's do everything that's not that already has no um regulation at all on it i i'm okay with that but i again mass tot are the people that had the had the brilliant idea of putting a stoplight at exit 24 which is the just the silliest thing in the world so you know, their judgment is is suspect in my mind when it comes to this kind of stuff because they decided to put that traffic light there. Well, Whatever. Yeah, again, I, I would suggest we listen to what they have, what would be their recommendation. Um, I don't know if that by any means is uh, something that we have to take their recommendation. In other words, if they recommend um, nothing, it still does not prohibit you as the board to say, we don't care, we want to stop sign there. 
Okay. All right. Okay. So you will confer with Mass DOT and and what get back with us as to what was decided. I will and give we, you a re, a report back at those locations. Okay, and at least add the the fifth one I mentioned. I don't know what else you you have, but. Uh, okay. Okay, moving. Moving on, uh, next one, discuss traffic count request to be submitted to FERCOG for this program year. Uh, Brian, I guess you got the, the request uh, from, I forget who, from uh, FERCOG to, for either uh, traffic count uh, volume class or uh, what, speed studies. Uh, Attorney movements to, to be submitted. Uh, and I, I think there was some discussion in the, in the past of doing one on, on Chestnut Plain Road further, I guess, near near uh, Claverick Road area, I guess, uh, maybe south even Claverick Road. And I, I guess the other, other location I would propose is, is on uh, Long Plain Road near the school, in front of the school. Well, we've got to reduce speed limits from 40 to 20 to do a study, see if people are paying attention to that during the day or evenings. I mean, we've got hours there. It's from what, eight to four, I think it's a reduced speeds. Are people slowing down during them hours or, or not? Uh, I, I think that would tell us whether we need to change the, maybe even change the hours or the speed if they're not doing it. And to me, that's, that's a bigger impact or could be a big impact on the school, uh, people accessing the school there. Uh, and also there's more, I would think truck traffic. The thing you don't realize every Tuesday morning or Tuesday, especially when the auction is there in Northampton, there's trucks going up and down Long Plain Road. Uh, they don't all come from 116. Do they slow down going through the school? I, I don't know. Your classification study will tell you that whether trucks are speeding through or not. Okay, I don't know if uh, anybody else, uh, Keith, anybody else has any other suggestions? You know, those two spots are fine. I know we've done one. I would have to look the timing, how long ago it was in front of the elementary school. Um, the other one that Joyce had asked for last year further south um i've already you know got that recommendation and i've given the, the the that information to brian so he has the house number location for that one okay and, and i guess if, if we're gonna go with the long plane one we'll to encourage them to do it while school is in session rather than the summer months. I don't know, the chestnut plane, if it matters much what time of year you do it, but the school one would. Okay. So who will, Brian, you'll respond to, to Furcog's request? Or does that come from the, from the chief or from Keith? Um. Who is I, I, I think I, either one of us can, any of okay. us can submit it, but we'll, we'll, we'll work it out. Okay. Any further discussion on this? No. Okay. Moving on. Uh, town administrator updates. Brian, you had a few things here you wanted to, to talk about. Yep. Um, complete streets grant. The next round for construction funding is uh, May 1st. Um, I've scheduled a meeting with the, uh, the complete streets committee for tomorrow at one o'clock. Um, we'll update the, uh, the prioritization plan, which prioritized, uh, transportation projects to increase all modes and safety, all modes of transportation and safety within the town. We'll update that, um, based on some of the projects that have been completed. Um, and we'll have a grant application for the select board to review at the next meeting. Um, hopefully, hopefully that will include the rest of, of Chestnut Plain Road and, and we can see what else 
we can fit within the um, the grant limits there. I've been in touch with um, Lori and Beth. They helped us last time. They're transportation planners at FERCOG, um, and they've offered to help us again. So um, we should be applying for that, and hopefully we can get that money and, and finish uh, Chestnut Plain Road and see what else is on the plan that we can that we can take care of. Um, let's see. Uh, MVP, MVP listening session is scheduled for April 21st at 6 p.m. That's a virtual meeting. There's information on the website about that. Um, that's the municipal vulnerability preparedness plan. That'll make the town eligible for um, MVP action grants. And speaking of the MVP action grants, um, we'll have to discuss, um, I think Keith, we should have a discussion initially and then we can expand that. Um, there's an MVP action grants. Those are due May 7th. So we'll have to figure out um, based on the MVP plan, what we want to apply for. Um, so that could also be a discussion at the next select board meeting. Um, Haydenville Road reconstruction project. I we had uh, Fred, Keith and I have been working on this. We had a call with, with Mass DOT um, two days ago. Um, it wasn't very eventful. They just reconfirmed the the cost sharing of, of 83% for Mass DOT, 17% for the town. That's something that we had discussed earlier. Um, the person we spoke with thought they were gonna have additional information specific information, but they didn't. So we're waiting to hear back from them. Um, for construction for that project, paying for construction, that's um, go, still included, at least in the draft transportation improvement plan at FERCOG. Um, I think that's in, still in 2025. Um, so we would need to get design. And we've also, um, the engineer that's working on the project that's, that's hired by MassDOT just sent out the 25% the submittal. So um, there'll be a public hearing scheduled on that at some point. And Keith has some questions that he needs to post to MassDOT on those submittals um, in regards to project limits and drainage. There seem to be some discrepancies um, in project limits and also questions about um, in terms of construction, who's gonna pay for drainage. So those will need to be uh, figured out. Um, I got a request from the town of Deerfield. They're submitting a, um, well, it looks like they already submitted a, a request to uh, Congressman McGovern's office for um, $6 million for a senior center. I think this is, on. It, it's kind of in the form of an earmark. They're asking for a letter of support. Um, for that, I sent the draft letter that um, I modified from Sunderland. Um, so I don't know if the board's okay with signing that to support that request. I, I mean, I, I think we should support it, but, um, I'm, I'm curious where that $6 million figure came from, because I know an awful lot about earmarks and you better have, um, defensible numbers to support the $6 million, because if you don't, they're going to say, I, how do I justify six million? I don't know whether it's going to cost eight or I don't know it's going to cost two. So, do you know where that six million came from? I will find out. But Casey, they didn't send along any supporting information. I assume there was an application they had to fill out to. What no, it's not. Nice. Fred, I don't the think so. process this time around is literally you send an executive summary with a budget. Um, the executive summary probably would be between one and three pages. Uh, from that, the, the members of Congress are allowed to submit 10 uh, proposals to the House Subcommittee uh, on uh, Labor, Health, and Human Services. Um, and there are a number of categories that fit within that or to House appropriations. Uh, and then if the Congressman's office, whichever one's the Congressman's office, decides to submit, they synthesize it down to literally 1,000 characters that include spaces. So the executive summary, so that the member of Congress can understand what's being requested in terms of a community project funding proposal, um, that's synthesized eventually if they accept what you want to do to 1,000 characters, and then it's voted on 
uh, by the Appropriations Committee as part of the fiscal 22 budget. So this money would flow post October 1st, 22, if it's even accepted. Um, you know, 10 years ago when this happened, the, most of the appropriations um, uh, dollars were in the 150 to $300,000 range. Uh, in Massachusetts, your largest one, because it was just after just after Senator Kennedy passed away. So there was a $13 million earmark to the Kennedy Library for a number of different programmatic things. So um, it is incredibly competitive. Um, there's no form, you, you make a case. And then if Congressman McGovern says, yes, this is one of the 10 that we want to submit for, he will then synthesize it down to a thousand characters. Okay, thanks, thanks for the explanation. Brian? Anything else? Um, so, so to, that's um, the board's all right with signing that letter. I I would sign support. It. I'm fine with it. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Um, one other thing I wanted to bring up, and it's I, I think it needs to be the the start of a larger conversation, um, and it has a lot of layers, um, but it but it, it it's come up in in. It came up in the personnel committee discussions about job responsibilities. Um, and it, it has to, it, it relates to um, difficulty filling boards and committee spaces. Um, it relates to um, what we expect to be pending retirements or not pending, but retirements in the near future. Um, it, Looking about workload, um, projects that 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 exist that are out there but that don't seem to be getting done or don't have a lot of movement. Um, and I, I think there's really there's a lot of different layers, um, and I, I really need more time to to sort of formulate it. But it, it's about it's about the town structure, it's about staffing, and it's about I think what we're going to need for the next 50 years. Um, there, there's a lot of different dynamics happening with, with local governments. Um, we're asking more of our boards and committees. We're asking them to, to, uh, to be more involved and it's, it's more technical. It, it's more involved. It's more time consuming. Um, and some of the boards and committees have people on them that have, that have the time and the knowledge to step up. Um, I fear the day when when Scott Jackson leaves the Conservation Commission. Um, he knows the wetland regulations inside and out, and it takes him very little time to administer the work of that board. But when he when he goes and when he stops being on that board, we need to figure out what we're going to do. Um, and I'm sure there's there's many other dedicated volunteers who I'm not going to mention, um, so I don't want this to be an exclusive list. Judy Marklin does a, a ton with the planning board. Um, and a lot of that administrative work. Um, and even some, of, even some of the select board members are, are stretched thin because they're filling roles on other boards where really we're having a hard time filling them. Jonathan does a lot of work with REC. Um, it, and it, it's just how do, we, how do we provide these services the best way we can? Um, knowing that that volunteerism is down. Um, things are becoming more technical. People don't have a lot of time. Um, community involvement's lower. I'm guilty of that in my own community. When I when I get home from work, the last thing I want to do is go to another town office and and volunteer on a boarding committee. Um, and then, like I said, we have retirements coming. And this this doesn't just apply to boards and committees. Um, we're going to have retirements coming. We're going to have police reform coming. Um, so, so, so how can we best position the town to, you know, to address these challenges in the next 20 years? Um, I, I don't know if, if the way that we've done this for 250 years is the best way to do it. Um, I suggest it's probably not. Um, you know, we, we have volunteers and they do their best. Um, you know, we have volunteers on the personnel committee. We have volunteers on the rec and, you know, those people cycle through and and it, it's it's just a challenge. It's a challenge to to 
to keep these boards filled. It's a challenge um, for them to to do the jobs that we ask of them. You know, things that part of part of what brought this on. Um, what motivated me to talk about this was was a question from the Solid Waste Committee and OSHA regulations. And that's, I mean, the Solid Waste Committee is in charge of the transfer station. Um, but they don't, they're not necessarily experts in running the transfer station. Uh, Fran, he's another person who devotes a tremendous amount of time to the Board of Health, to the Solid Waste Committee. Once Fran goes, I, again, that's, that's another one that makes me a little nervous um, a, a, as to how that, as to how that slack's going to be picked up. Um, and do we need to, do we need to look at some sort of DPW structure? Um, this is what came up in the personnel committee meetings. What, um, what happens if, if at Hurley Frontier, um, Frontier builds the fields in Deerfield and they say, no, thanks, Waitley, we're going to, you know, they maintain them right now, some parts of them. So, uh, I mean, who's going to maintain those fields? Um, if anything was that, if Darcy was to leave the cemetery commissioner, she's doing a lot of the work there. Neil's doing some, but if we lose some of these key people in these key roles, we're going to be, we're going to be ill prepared to pick up the slack. I think. Um, so, so I, I, I'm not really sure what the solution is, but that's what I see. Um, I would like to make a suggestion, and I, I think you're absolutely right, Brian. I, I. I think the way town government was structured 250 years ago, um, perhaps may not be the right structure for the 21st century. Um, but whatever discussions we we have, I, I genuinely believe that they should not take place strictly within the confines of the town of Waitley. Um, I think that the towns that we historically partner with on other service delivery things, you know, specifically Deerfield, Conway, Sunderland, and to some extent Hatfield, um, we really need to have this conversation with them because I'm absolutely positive that they are confronting the same challenges that we are. And to think that we can solve for these problems in our own silo, in our own parochial little world, um, we're nuts. So I think that we should have a conversation. And, and that way also no one feels offended when we talk about regionalization of X, Y, or Z. It's talking about regionalization of our service delivery in different ways, shapes, and forms. Um, but, but it should be a conversation we have with those five communities, I, I believe. Okay, uh, Brian, uh, I I hear what you're saying, and 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 don't dispute anything you you said. You you told us some of that in in writing, I guess. Uh, I would maybe suggest that if we're gonna if if the op an option is to, is to hire additional people, either to create positions or temporaries or or consultants to to make sure that you have enough money in your budget for next fiscal year to do that. And I think today is the, this is the time to do it, to get it in the budget process and go through finance, and increase your, your town administration budget for if you wanna call it, create a position, grant writing or assistant or, or whatever, to put money in there for that position so we don't keep arguing in the future about whether there's a need and how much and all that to, to put something in there as a placeholder for now uh, can be a requirement that won't be spent unless the board uh, uh, agrees to it or, or whatever, but to, to have something in there. So we're all thinking of maybe expanding the administrative staff of the town you know, to have money in there. We always spend money on, on capital projects and it, and it takes effort to get a capital project approved, uh, financed, built with the same town support, town administrative staff. Not only your, your staff, your Brian and Amy, but you got Lynn and Janet in there and even the assessor in there, uh, plus some of the other departments. So so I would I would suggest you look at your budget and, and add a 
you know, I, I would think, you know, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars to put in there for for additional support. I don't see that as a problem with our with our budget and the things we're doing and the things that you say we need to get into. Yeah, I don't know about the uh, amount, um, but I do think we should, even if only symbolically, put this in the budget so that the finance committee is aware that this is something we're thinking about. And I, I'm sure there are going to be things where you need support and we might need to hire either a consultant or hire a part-timer in the near term while we're trying to solve the bigger problem in the long term. So I, I would not have any objection to, to putting that in so that it gets something gets done in this budget cycle. And I don't know how big the number should be, though. That's the one thing. Fifty or $60,000 is a whole new employee full-time practically, right? I don't, I, I don't know if that's uh, the right amount. Um, I'd certainly listen to you know, all comers on, on what they think. But I think we, if we don't put it in the budget, it's not real, right? Right. I, um, I agree with that. I think we need to put it in the budget. I do think that needs to be in the budget as a, a, as a temporary position with no end date to that temporariness because... <laughs> I, I do believe that we need structural, mm. a structural remedy. And if it, let's say just hypothetically that if we hired a full-time staffer to, to pick up the slack and Deerfield did and Conway did and Sunderland did, and then we decided, yeah, we can regionalize some of these services. Someone's going to say, yeah, but I was hired full-time. So we want to make sure that whoever we bring on understands mm. that there's a process in place to figure out how to fix the structural challenges so that no one's, people are going in with eyes wide open in terms of if, if they want to tackle this position. Right, and, and I would yeah, I would su support that and, and not only limit it to hiring a position, but maybe a consultant is the answer, part-time consultant or, or whatever, get additional services. It doesn't have to be another position on board or we even talked before of sharing with another town a position, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and the sharing will as, take longer to accomplish. Right. Yeah. As um, far as the, how much money, well, I, I think if you look at FERCOG survey, you can see what some of the assistants, some of the other positions are. I give you an, a ballpark uh, idea. Yeah, I think we need to put something reasonable. Don't, don't put a minimum amount in because you're not going to get anything for $5,000 or whatever. I think it has to be a reasonable position. And if you're going to attract people to do that, it's got to be a reasonable amount. Yeah, I, I, I mean, again, we're, we're throwing darts at what that dollar amount should be. Um, if we hire a consultant, we don't have to worry about, 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 about benefits. That being said, if there are actual hours that somebody's working and, and we are looking for them to work those hours and not have a, stru a scheduled structure on their own, we can't hire a consultant that has to be a paid employee. That, that's just that's just the law. Um, so, you know, consultants are there to help people put together, you know, strategies and, and, and to do things on their own time. But I, I'm hard pressed to believe that this is going to be on their own time. Um, so whatever budget number goes in, it has to be both. It has to be both salary and, and, and fringe because it's going to be more than I got to believe it's going to be more than 19 hours. Okay. So maybe you, 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 you just throw a placeholder in of, again, geez, I don't know what, you know, I don't know what you get for, for 50, 50, 50 in fringe. I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, because that could be, I, I don't want to sound like it's no money and I don't want to sound like it's a lot of money. I, I, I just don't know, but I think it should be full time and, but it should be, a, it, it should be a temporary position. All right. That could turn into permanent, depending upon what happens with with our discussions with our friends and neighbors. Yeah. Okay. Brian, is that does that help you? Yeah, it, it does. I, I I mean, like like I mentioned, I think there's there's really two. I separated the two parts. One is one is a uh, um, it's sort of an immediate staffing need that if we want to keep pursuing grants and really um um 
tackle mm-hmm. the OSHA stuff like we need to and the personnel committee stuff. And um, I, I'm sure the finance committee would love somebody to work with on their tax uh, tax oh, rate working group. And I, I mean, we could use financial policies. Um, a lot of towns have financial policies, but it we don't have them. Um, mm-hmm. and, and part of it is is part of it's a staffing issue. We don't we don't have the time to work with the finance committee to develop these policies, um, and it's not an initiative that the committee has undertaken itself to do. Um, so, in the point, you know, the planning board has requested help um, with sort of their um, their land use and, and planning stuff. Um, so. I, I think there's a need for help now, um, mm-hmm. but there's also the, the larger issue of, and it really came up in with the personnel committee in, in the you know case position. It, it, he gets asked to do things that maybe aren't necessarily highway, what would be traditionally the highway superintendent's job, which would be streets and roads, um, or even the building superintendent's job. Um, you know we have facilities that that I think um, it, we would be better off if we had a single person, a single paid person, staff person who was responsible for them. Um, and I, I think it's it's a good way to go. But longer term, um, we have to, I, I think the, the town's best served by looking about how it provides, how it provides these services, um, whether it's regionalization, whether it's, um, I don't know what it would be, whether, whether we go it alone, it, depending on, on what we find, but it's definitely things that I think we should look at. Um, in retirement is typically when, typically I, I think there's less resistance to regionalization when there are retirements. I think that's an opportunity um, because there's, there's resistance when, when people feel, when people are defensive because they feel like they're going to lose employment or, or people are going to lose employment. So um, retirement's typically a good time to look at those types of things. Um, so it's really short-term and long-term. Um, you know, hey, Brian, I just want to, because we want to be careful about, about job descriptions, and, et cetera. And, and I don't mean to sound defensive, and, and I apologize if I do, but, you know, use, use the, the softball field as the example. Um, <clears throat> Keith, a couple of years ago, was given the responsibility of facilities in, in the town of Waitley. Um, it, it has always been my understanding and inter- interpretation, interpretations are subject to interpretation, um, that that includes every asset that the town owns, and that would be fields. Um, it's no different than if, if, if a building is going up or renovations are happening. So I want to be careful that we when we're going through this process, we truly understand what current responsibilities and descriptions are and yep. not, and not be interpretive, interpretive in subject to interpretation, because genuinely that would, my definition of Keith's job would include non-structural facilities. Am I right or wrong? I don't know, but I think we just need to be careful about that. Um, and I would echo your point about the regional Peace and 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 people's comfort with 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 changes, um, but I think that people need to understand that change is probably going to come because we cannot continue the way we're going. Okay. Yeah, it's you know clearing up responsibilities and in job descriptions. That's that's that needs to be part of the discussion because for how we maintain Hurley Park in. And who's in charge of what is an, is an important discussion for us to have as, as an example, um, you know, because there's probably capital improvements that could be done at Hurley in terms of the driveway and things like that in the parking lot. And I don't necessarily know that we know whose responsibility that is to make those recommendations as an example. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I know who that, who that, who that falls to. Is it direct commission? Is it, is it, is it the highway superintendent? Is it, Frontier, I don't know who it is. Well, yeah, um, it wouldn't be Frontier because they don't, but, right. um, you know, it's it a lot. And, and, and there's no defined 
you know, because again, it goes, we talked about it years ago, different organizations are responsible for things, but they may not have the skill set to make the right. They, again, I have no problem using Hurley as example. We all know that the driveway and parking lot is a disaster. We know that it's not ADA compliant. We know all these types of things, but you need a skill set to figure out what is to be done with that. And because we're a volunteer driven community, these volunteer yep. com committees don't have those skill sets. They can identify a problem, but they don't have the skill set to, to focus on a solution. And it's, and it's a problem. Yep. Okay. Anybody else have any comments on what we're discussing here? No. Okay. Uh, items I anticipated. Well, just quickly, uh, we've got the uh, 250th celebration motor parade is going to be occurring on April 24th, which is a Saturday at 3 p.m. Uh, and uh, Waitley Select Board will be on a float if they choose. Will you? Well, I guess you don't have to answer today, but uh, you're welcome to be on a float on the 24th. That will accommodate all three of us and ride around town and participate in the parade. Uh, What's the duration of that parade, Fred? Pardon? What's the duration of that parade? I, I think I've heard it's like a little over an hour driving through through town at, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 miles an hour at a slower speed or slower going by houses. So uh, I would, that's what I heard, a little over an hour presentation. So a parade through all of most of the town, not every route, every road, but majority. I, I don't know if I can make it to put that out there. Okay. Joyce, will you participate? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And um, everybody should have by Saturday in your mailbox um, a special issue of the scoop, which will have the map with the uh, map of town with the route outlined. Okay. So it'll be really clear where the, where they're going and everybody should have a copy of that. Right. Okay. Okay. And, and then our uh, next uh, select board meeting is gonna be on April 26th, which is uh, our incorporation date. And we need to set a time. Uh, do we keep the 6 p.m. time like we have for meetings? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. I think that, yeah, otherwise people will either be early or late. <laughs> okay, and- Hey, Fred. Proposing maybe uh, a- uh, 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 early in the in the in the meeting, I don't know whose phone. Okay, uh, some info, some uh, highlights of the parade, and uh, brief discussions, uh, proclamations, and and citations uh, for that recognizing that date. So uh, they'll be in the beginning of, of the of the meeting, so. Uh, anything else? Anybody else have anything they wanna bring up? That in the, the next meeting after that, we'll be back on our Wednesday schedule, May 12th, so. Okay. I'll make motion to adjourn. Second. Okay, we'll call vote, Joyce. Aye. Jonathan. Yep. Fred, yes. Okay, meeting adjourned. Good night. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, Amy. Good night.